Hello, everybody. Welcome. It's just afternoon, so I'll go ahead and get started and hopefully um, others will trickle in um, while I do some introductions. So welcome again um, from San Antonio. My name is Lana Metter and I am the Assistant Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art at the San Antonio Museum of Art. And it's my great pleasure to be here with you this afternoon with um, artist Jennifer Ling Datchuk in conversation as part of the Texas Talks Art program. And um, if you're unaware, I will give you a background on Texas Talks Art. Um, it's a program that's been going on um, all year. Texas Talks Art is an unprecedented multi-institutional initiative intended to introduce the work of artists across the state of Texas to a wider audience. Taking the form of virtual 30 minute lunchtime talks, the series features 50 Texas artists and artist collectives in conversation with 50 Texas curators. The talks are free and take place every Tuesday at noon central. So please check the website, texastalksart.org for a list of upcoming programs and more information. I'd like to take a moment to thank the very generous um, supporters of the Texas Talks Art Program. So thank you to your support for Deborah Dupre and Richard Rothberg, McGinnis Family Fund of Communities Foundation of Texas, Tatum Art Advisory, Erin Cooley Gallery, Jerry Ann Cheney, and a special thanks to our media partner, Glass Tire. Here's just a preview of the upcoming talks that we have. So please register on the website. On October 26th, Teresa Hubbard and Alexander Birchler will be in conversation with Jennifer, or I'm sorry, not Jennifer, I'm in conversation with Jennifer, Andrea Carnes um, at the Modern in Fort Worth. On November 2nd, Ariel Renee Jackson will be in conversation with Kendall Gross from the art galleries at Black Studies um, at the University of Texas at Austin. And just as a reminder, um, there's a Q&A function here on the Zoom and um, we're happy to save some time at the end of our conversation to answer your questions. So feel free to, to type in as they come to you um, while we're giving the presentation. And so I will start with a, a formal introduction uh, of Jennifer, although I hope um, many of you are, are already familiar with her incredible work. Um, Jennifer Ling Datchik was born in Warren, Ohio and raised in Brooklyn, New York. And she now lives and works here in San Antonio, Texas. Her work is an exploration of her layered identity as a woman, a Chinese woman, as an American and as a third culture kid. Trained in ceramics with an MFA from Dartmouth, she works with porcelain and other materials that are often associated with women's work. And um, through these works, she discusses um, issues such as fragility, beauty, femininity, intersectionality, identity, and personal history. And Jennifer has been invited to participate in, in very prestigious international residencies such as um, the Blue Star Contemporary Art Museum's Berlin Residency, the Pottery Workshop in Jingjijin, China, the Vermont Studio Center, the European Ceramic Works Center in the Netherlands, and most recently, um, she was a resident at Art Pace here in San Antonio. Her practice was the subject of a 2018 monograph um, that was produced by French in Michigan through their um, publication program. And she has been recognized with numerous awards, including the 2020 United States Artist Fellow in Craft, an Emerging Voices Award from the American Craft Council, a Black Cube Nomadic Museum Artist Fellowship, and as the 2021 Texas State Three-Dimensional Artist of the Year. In addition to her studio practice, she is also a teacher, um, Jennifer is an assistant professor of studio art at Texas State University, and her work is in the collections of the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, and I'm proud to say also the San Antonio Museum of Art. Um, we're looking at here um, the piece that Sama acquired earlier this year. It's called Enter the Dragon, 
And um, this acquisition was part of a larger initiative to acquire the work by San Antonio artists. And the museum convened a community advisory committee um, to provide feedback um, um, about this process. And um, it was comprised of members of our board of trustees, um, as well as other visual artists, um, professors, local leaders in the arts here in San Antonio and private collectors. And it was um, no surprise to me that, that Jennifer was, was at the top of everyone's list, um, recommended to, to enter the museum's collection and, and was enthusiastically you know, supported by, by all involved. Um, and so I'm thrilled that we were able to acquire this, this work into the dragon and it will be on view later this year in the museum's contemporary galleries alongside other works that we've acquired through this initiative. Um, so with that, I will turn it over um, to, to Jennifer to give us a bit more background on this work as well as um, some of her other recent work. Thank you, Lana. Hello, um, everyone. Thank you for joining us on your brief, um, hopefully your lunch break somewhere. Hello, um, old Texas friends, new Texas friends, and people from afar. Um, I'm super honored that Enter the Dragon is part of SAMA's collection. I think it's so important to see our stories reflected in um, what our institutions are collecting. Um, Enter the Dragon is, um, is a title that borrows from the movie of the same name that famously stars um, Chinese American martial arts actor Bruce Lee. And like, I was a huge fan of Bruce Lee growing up because I saw a Chinese man on screen with like power and poise. Um, and that is someone who didn't grow up fluent, um, fluently speaking Cantonese, like I was glued to these movies and I learned like so much from um, language and expression, but body and movement. Um, I was obsessed with Bruce Lee in that he was able to bridge the gap between East and West and kind of dismantle the stereotype of the emasculated Asian man. Um, I just wish sometimes it didn't take fighting or violence to prove masculinity. Um, I think every year too, I have a personal goal of learning martial arts and I um, wanted to learn Jeet Kune Do, the form he um, created, but I learned um, when trying to find a studio at the top that, that it's based off of Wing Chun, which is a martial arts form that was created by a nun. And that this was a form of self-defense taught um, to women as a means to defend itself against unwanted advances of men. And that kind of blew my mind because in some ways I wanted to learn martial arts to like defend myself in case there was ever a situation. Um, but I think through my childhood hero, I learned about the forgotten history and role of women in martial arts. But most importantly, that women have been creating modes of protection against men since the beginning of time. Um, and I think about this um, in other pieces throughout my practice. I was so fascinated when I learned, you know, about the story behind this work and um, the nun, um, her name was Ing Moy, um, who, who created this form of martial arts and she's fascinating. And I had no idea, you know, the history behind her before learning about this piece and wondered if you knew about her or, um, you know, what role does research play in your process? Um, I didn't know about her, which makes me really sad because I think I, at first I think too, Bruce Lee is finally um, reaching a moment in our history where people are really appreciating all that he did as um, an Asian American and that he was born in the United States, but was always othered. Um, he was never considered fully American. And that um, I think learning more about him, I like wanted to learn more about his form of martial arts and his readings and his teachings and the kind of culture he created around it. Um, and I think trying to find a Wing Chun studio, I found that there's one in San Antonio. And um, yeah, I think I just am fascinated by knowledge and like wanting to get the full picture of the whole story of things. So I kind of like go where the research takes me and like kind of dive deeper into subjects because I think I was presented this like facade of what martial arts was and that I'd only see men fighting or men performing it. So um, yeah, I was happy to make this discovery. That's fantastic. As always, there's um, more layers to, to the histories than, than we're aware of. And I think too, part of like research and I, I very much consider storytelling and oral history as part of research because so much of like 
what I've learned about my family and uh, comes from talking to our ancestors and our elders and like those stories that go undocumented. And so something I, I started doing just in my community and like being a Texas transplant of being here 13 years now, um, just thinking about protection and the conversations around guns of being a teacher and being really concerned um, if I would teach differently, being a classroom, knowing that students can bring guns in their backpacks. I think now I sometimes forget about it, but asking people like, what was it that made them feel safe? And it was a lot of times I heard it was the weight of it on their hip. Um, I heard that many times from women, but I also heard that um, there were other modes of protection that women would create and that would come from putting bricks in their purses, kind of a form of concealed carry so that they can walk safely alone at night or in a group or wherever they were going. And that um, the weight of the brick in their purse slung across their shoulder um, was kind of safety information passed down from mother to daughter, auntie to niece and girl to women. So this is my version of it, um, porcelain bricks um, with um, clasps with leather straps that can be detached and used if needed. Um, that these, even these bricks are made in the size of what is called a queen brick, which is um, the gendered more slender version um, of a, a brick too. It's interesting that even bricks have to be have to be gendered these days. Yeah. Wow. Um, I think too a lot about language um, in this piece. Exotic, um, a descriptor every Asian woman has probably heard, and it includes anyone that is foreign or different, but um, used as a, a describer for being beautiful. And it usually comes with a comment about your eyes. This is um, a figurine that I found from a hobbyist mold, most likely from the 70s or 80s, um, that probably existed in the realm of kitsch, but we very much know now that it's very misogynist and racist. That is, she is a stereotype of a China girl with her bob haircut um, and um, her bangs, the rice picker hat, the heavy shoulder yoke across her back, carrying these heavy baskets with a China across her key pile, and that she's barefoot. And that she rests atop this trophy case filled with broken blue and white shards of willow wear um, from all over the world. And that willow wear is the most appropriate pattern, blue and white pattern in the world that has no known origin. And that her working body um, rests atop this rubble and that she keeps on going. And when yesterday, when we were kind of talking a bit about our presentation, you told me a little bit about the history of this figurine. Because I was wondering where you where you found her, and that's what I, I find very fascinating about the motifs and the different um, images that you use is these long histories of of the many um, you know functions and and stories that go with them. Um, so as someone who's trained in ceramics, I very much love objects and I'm one of those people that if you invite me to your house, I will pick and turn over every dish to read um, the context or the label on the bottom. Same goes with like um, ceramic objects like figurines. Um, I found this in someone's garage that they had got from um, like a paint your pottery kind of place where you would go and paint um, bisque fired ceramics for fun. Um, and I was like instantly attracted to her, these like dis these dis depictors of like working women. And then I scour eBay all the time for these. So this was most likely made in a hobbyist mold because there were no markings on it. But um, there are also many porcelain manufacturers that made versions of her. So very much a, um, a fetishized object of an Asian woman. Another, you know, aspect of your practice that I find really um, interesting and engaging is um, your use of, of text and language and particularly like vernacular phrases like we see here and whether it's the actual text, um, you know, in the piece or it's through the title like Enter the Dragon, um, there's always these kind of um, references there and I wondered if you could speak um, a bit more about um, your interest in text um, I see it as part of this kind of whole cross-cultural exchange that's inherent in your materials and your subjects. Um, um, but perhaps you could tell us a bit more about your interest in language. 
Yeah, I think um, porcelain has a global migration throughout the world. Um, same with blue and white. So I'm looking at how objects and pattern and decoration crisscross the world, but also that very much happens with language. I think about this title, Exotic AF, and how I very much dated myself in 2017, um, hashtag vernacular, which sometimes it makes me cringe, but I think it was important to acknowledge that at that time is that I feel like in 2017, by putting AF, the exclamation point at the end of this, it was um, a reclamation of the word for me, that um, I think someone who's grown up as a third culture kid who, um, like lived in a household that was Chinese speaking, but I wasn't fluent. I think I was always trying to read the subtext and context of conversations where um, many times in Chinese, I, I, I only know how to speak in honorific terms. So sometimes when I speak to like a friend, they're like, why are you talking to me that way? So I think language is deeply fascinating to me and that um, I love too that like, I can search exotic AF as a hashtag and see how it has traveled the world. Yeah, that's an excellent point that now we have like images associated with words um, through these hashtags and the way they've been used um, in social media. I love that. Um, I continued working with this figurine um, for a prompt and exhibition on fulfillment centers, um, those big warehouses like the Amazon um, centers and Walmart that kind of drive consumerism and capitalism. Um, this figurine, her body disrupts the perfect strata of these 300 um, stacks of red welcome mats. Um, red welcome mats are typically found in front of every Asian business, um, welcoming you as you enter in and to do business in their establishment. Um, I have a connection to a family owned factory in China that helped me customize these mats to say live to die. And that live to die um, comes from a statement that I found right while researching alphabet samplers from the 1800s in which young girls stitched their AB ABCs and one, two, threes. And at the end of these often included their name, the date and a morality clause. And live to die was popular um, during this time because it spoke about life expectancy and how short it was during that time and the high infant mortality rate. And I don't think these, um, and these alphabet samplers were considered the first form of female education here in the United States. But I'm not sure if these young, like eight or nine year old girls knew the power um, of these words. Um, I loved how live to die was kind of a very blunt cycle, kind of matter of fact. Um, and I feel that this statement mirrors the um, conversations of consumerism, consumption, and capitalism, that cycle that drives us to keep buying, spending, and acquiring. And I can't help but think about too, when um, we talk about these conversations of labor and how we can get things so quickly and cheaply that we think about um, the statement made in China and how we often perceive these goods to be cheap, poorly made, or less quality. But what makes the labor of yellow bodies less than that of labor of made in America? Um, thinking about how corporations have been taking advantage of global inequalities all over the world for a very long time. And that um, sometimes too, um, it takes a while for ideas of mine to become reality and like back scratchers have kind of sat in my brain for a while. Um, and it kind of started from seeing this, this display of um, oriental, original oriental bamboo back scratchers for 99 cents at Walgreens. Um, it's a simple, practical and cheap tool to help you relieve, reach and relieve an out of reach itch. Um, and then I saw this image circling around social media for a few weeks into the pandemic. This was um, April 30th of 2020. Um, I think like many, I was home from teaching and trying to navigate the, like some sense of continuity of education for my students, um, while also being like deeply afraid of the unknowns in the world. While watching protests happen because people demanded the economy open back up with haircuts and the demand to get your nails done when no one considered that the people behind the mask risking their lives for your care, comfort, and beauty, and that these jobs um, don't pay a livable hourly wage but are so dependent on tips. So I made my version of back scratchers. 
Um, I scratch your back, you scratch none are my versions made in porcelain in the style of bamboo with tiny hands with um, long red fingernails and um, crystal adornments on them. Um, I come from a long line of service industry Asians, um, those that trim your cuticles, wash your hair, um, gut your fish, sew your clothes, um, and watch your children. And this invisible labor provides so much care, comfort, and stability to your life, but um, often I think the people that do this feel very invisible. I love how your work, you know, opens up this conversation um, about the, the hidden labor behind beauty and self-care because so often, you know, you're, you're told to take care of yourself and, and take time for yourself and, and you want to indulge in all these beauty products, but you don't think about everything behind it. Um, and I know you've organized some, some activities, um, some community events where um, there's been manicuring or hair braiding um, or, or, or um, writing on beads. And I wonder if you consider, you know, your work part of a social practice. Oh, um, I think there are artists that do social practice really well. I think for me, it's including um, members of the community or people that um, really inform my practice into the art space and art institutions. Um, I think about how nail salons and hair salons are sites of sisterhood and camaraderie, but it's also, they can be sites of appropriation. Um, I think a lot happens in these environments. I so consider hair, hair artists and nail salons to also be artists. Um, nail artists are painting on the tiny canvases on our fingers. Um, that I think too, like living in San Antonio, I can see my Asian community when I go to a nail salon. Um, and that when I go, I rarely go, um, but when I do, I don't get the same, um, kind of like self-care experience that maybe some of my friends do where um, they can go and zone out and have that they can be carefully tended to where when I go, it's, where are you from? Where do you go shopping? Like, it's where we see someone that looks like us and we wanna like know more about each other. And then, um, but I also feel like I get to know the person who is so um, gently taking care of me. So I wanna bring those conversations into spaces um, that I show my work because their stories are so important to it. Um, thinking too of like all experiences women have, like as women navigate the corporate ladder and the aspirations of wearing um, the professional and sometimes conservative pearl necklace, um, women of color navigate these situations wearing the cement pearl necklace. The heaviness that comes from being in a workplace where very few people look like you and that the extra invisible labor you perform for equality and representation in that, those situations. Um, this is um, an enlarged um, concrete beads with um, smaller porcelain beads um, necklace, um, enlarged to kind of confront the body in which we, how we navigate these situations. I think as a, as a woman, I recognize the choices we have, but I also see that there, there are so many um, societal, cultural, and political systems that hold us back and don't make those choices um, easy or accessible to everyone. But one thing I do think too, is how can I have these conversations with choice? And I'm doing that with this idea of adornment because adorn adornment is a choice that we can make every day. And this is uh, included in an exhibition, correct? And in, in Houston, you have some work up on view. Yes, so this is a newer piece that's um, in at the Houston Center for Contemporary Craft for um, a new exhibition called Later, Longer, Fewer. I can't wait to see it. Thank you. How long is it up? It's up till January 9th. Perfect. Um, so like kind in Goat Girls, I'm acknowledging the camaraderie and contributions of girls and women and particularly girls and women of color. These are slipcast um, ribbons, very much modeled after um, horse show ribbons, um, the prizes given to horses based on like the beauty of their um, hair um, and their agility. Um, the greatest of all time girl celebrates girlhood's achievements and thinking about how all young girls love horses because it represents kind of this feeling of being free, of being wild and being able to run, but we 
so much happens in our girlhood that robs us of our innocence and then in which we become tamed to our current situations. Um, these are made from um, slip cast um, clay made for porcelain dolls and how there's lots of um, shades of um, blush and beige, um, but then when it comes down to certain colors, it gives one color for one race. I think too of how I've purchased the Asian color throughout my time in ceramics and a long time ago, um, about 10 years ago, it was called Oriental. When I purchased a lot of it recently, it was Asian. And then when I purchased it again, it was called Sahara. And just how problematic the categorization of colors are in terms of like representing one race and that the, there are many shades within us. But I, one thing I love about this piece is that I didn't see dolls that look like me growing up and that when this is installed, I always get pictures of young girls holding their hands to the piece to try and find themselves in it. And then thinking about too, um, these spaces we can create for one another to have difficult conversations, to kind of share the um, kind of the truth before we share the beauty of the flowers in our lives. Um, Bave Cave is very much um, taking on that gendered space, the man cave, um, as though men need protective spaces in domestic settings when I firmly believe domestic spaces should have shared labor that the Babe Cave is um, made from blue synthetic hair that creates this protective um, environment that houses this table. And I see the table as a universal forum that provides an intimate space um, where personal experiences um, can come about and have an ease to like be able to share them. That around the border of this table is um, painted affirmations that I collected and received from community members um, that and then um, blue and white imagery that like the uterus, which I see so on everything now, which I'm so thankful to see a part of the female reproductive organ on t-shirts and stickers and bumper stickers. Um, the peach, which is a symbol of longevity in Asian art, my version, the cut peach, I feel the peach is a very sensual fruit, but what does it mean when it's cut in half and it starts drying out? Um, Venus of Willendorf, who has reached like pop icon status um, in the world, and the chrysanthemum, which um, also another flower used in Chinese art, but is um, a flower that survives the first frost. So I really identified with that, th that as a survivor. Um, that I worked with a, a factory in Jindijin, China, that makes these tabletops and stools where the husbands do the throwing and the wives do the painting. And I spent three days with them and their children working alongside them in their factory slash home. And like, I think their, uh, their labor too and what they make as craftspeople is like a super important part of like the creation of this work. And then ending on this piece, um, I think too of like kind of the social and racial reckoning that's happening in the world of um, how like I've heard this expression or this saying, me love you long time. I've heard it directed at me many times throughout my life, how um, it's a, a, a saying that comes from a Stanley Kubrick movie, Full Metal Jacket, in which a sex worker approaches a group of American soldiers and says it that it um, has moved throughout um, our culture, um, an expression that is racist and misogynist, and that many times too, as an Asian woman, many times people would tell me, well, you're just half. Um, but even in these moments where I hear this directed towards me, I'm recognized as full. And that Asian women navigate racism on top of misogyny um, as they navigate their bodies through the world. And that instead of saying me love you long time, I want to reclaim that and remind everyone to love yourself a long time, um, to like find um, power in this affirmation. So this is up in Houston at the Houston Center for Contemporary Craft um, behind a red curtain, very much the red curtain as a, a kind of a mirror to the red velvet curtains on a stage where an un, a, a performer stands and waits um, of the unknown audience in front of them of creating this protective space where you enter through this red curtain and read affirmations adorned on the beads that um, to give ourselves these expressions or sayings to help us navigate the really difficult times.
So thank you. Thank you so much for sharing all of this. Um, it's, it's thrilling to see your new work. And like I said, I can't wait to get over to Houston to see it in person. Um, but this is a wonderful preview of some of the directions you're, you're going in. Um, when I saw this piece um, and thinking about it in context with, with Enter the Dragon that just entered Sama's collection, you've started using kind of a mirrored material. And you know the body has always been kind of present in your work without being necessarily depicted. Um, but I wondered if um, you know you were what you were thinking about when when starting to use mirrored materials. If it was kind of implicating you know the viewer in a way in some of these these systems um, that that you um, address in your work, or maybe it's kind of a, a, a call to action for for us the viewer. Yeah, definitely. I. I feel like as someone who works, like all my ideas start in porcelain, they start in clay and they're, when it's fired, there's a hardness to it. So in many ways, I rejected the use of the mirror because that's also a hardness. But when they are paired together, like I loved the edge that it, it kind of blurred when object met mirror. And that like in Enter the Dragon, it's these gold mirror tile, tiles where your image is kind of blurred kind of taking on the scene and the famous scene in which Bruce Lee is fighting with himself in the mirror, but trying to fight the foe through the mirror. So it's a really um, kind of epic battle scene where you see him confronting his image. And I thought about that a lot and that how do I see myself in these works, but how do I get the viewer to see themselves in this work and then start questioning everything they thought about it. Um, even something as simple as enter the dragon. Um, I'm making work about, um, how women were lost in the history of martial arts, but like dragons in Chinese is the male representation. Um, typically, like I, I played around with, should it be called enter the phoenix, which is the female representation of the animal. Um, love yourself long time very much to like the choice of using the mirror for this was it's a play on the neon sign. Um, neon signs too that like exist in like black lit windows where like you see your reflection at night. Um, I think too, like it really is you confronting, it's a call to action to really the viewer to kind of like question this statement, which I think all the time how maybe my students don't know where this statement come, came from, kind of the generational separation in this, but um, they've definitely heard it. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. I'm going to check and see we're, you know, kind of right at time to see if we have any questions in the q and a if if you have any questions for Jennifer, feel free to to submit those. Um, while we see if anyone puts any questions in the q and a, I'll ask you, um, this is one of the Texas Talks Art talks that we ask all of our participants. And um, what is one of your favorite works? in a Texas museum and why? Um, this was like a very hard question to answer. And um, I kind of always, and this is just like happens to be like an object in Sama's collection in that um, I think the Chinese art collection at Sama is amazing. They have a huge um, collection of Jindijin porcelain. And there's one piece I go back to and I look for it every time I visit. And it's a small plate and, um, vase that has um, bats painted on it, but done in shades of like pink, peach, and yellow. And it feels so contemporary and modern um, and so different than all the like really heavily adorned blue and white works. But the bats is a symbol of longevity. I still am trying to figure out ways to like kind of bring that imagery into my practice. I love that. And I, I'm so excited to have your work in Sama's collection because we do have this, you know, rich history of collecting um, Chinese ceramics. And there's so many conversations there with, with your work and, and how you're bringing, um, you know, this medium, but also many other ideas, you know, forward and, and, and into it. So thank you so much. There's a few questions, I think. Um, let's see, from Sarah Chavaria, if you could experiment with a new technique or material, what would it be? Oh my gosh, I, um, I don't know. That's a really hard one. Um, 
I mean, there's definitely, I wish I had access to more sometimes. Like I even think of like this red hair curtain. I, what does it mean if it would be real hair instead of synthetic? Um, I kind of think, um, yeah, I think too, I can't just pick a material. It has to be something that I can like dive into and research and like pick apart. Um, Cause so much too, I think about material culture and the objects and things I'm working with. Um, but I will think about that one a lot now if I had unlimited resources and budget and opportunities. So thank you for that question. Another question is from Emily Dujour. Why do you like to create artworks with porcelain? Porcelain is my first love. It is um, kind of like when I was going through school, like I failed miserably at painting and drawing. Like when things are put flat onto a page, I get stuck. But if it's in something 3D, I, I can see it better. Um, I loved clay from the beginning because it's malleable and it can be anything and everything. And it's part skill and then part science, which I loved. Porcelain, um, it was discovered in China. The kaolin, the material that comprises a porcelain, was discovered in Jindijin. And that, for me, it's a, a bridge to my cultural heritage. Um, that it is a material that is, has like contained so many dualities of fragility um, and of being like extremely virtue, um, vitrified and hard. Like I love it for that in itself. Um, and I feel like I use that a lot as um, metaphors throughout the pieces I create in porcelain. And I, I think our, you know, piece in Zama's collection, you know, really encompasses that the dualities of the masculine and the feminine and the hard and the soft mm -hmm. and um, the fact that there's nunchucks made out of, of porcelain with these gorgeous decals um, is, is just endlessly interesting to me. Um, I, yeah. love, Any more questions? I love those decals on Enter the Dragon nunchucks and that um, those nunchucks were handmade in porcelain using like an extruder and then I roll little coils and make all the chains to connect them. But um, the imagery on it came from a trip to Jindij in China where I visited um, Decal Alley, which um, decals are like stickers that you apply onto ceramics and fire on um, in the kiln. Uh, but I'd never seen one in those bright decals in those bright neon colors, um, which to me kind of felt like the Lisa Frank version of um, Chinese decals, which very much shows I am a kid from the 80s. I remember having Lisa Frank everything. So yeah. <laughs> I love that in, reference. in a way that, um, yeah, I find really fascinating. That's fantastic. Well, um, we're just over our 30 minute time slot. So I want to let everybody enjoy their lunch. Um, but thank you so much, Jennifer, for being in conversation with me and, and sharing your insights into your work. And um, can't wait to see um, what you do next. And thanks to everybody for, for joining us and taking some time out of your day. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'm sorry if you heard a little whining chihuahua in the background. <laughs> My elderly dog is having a really bad day today. So thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.